thank you very much. It's absolutely fantastic to be here and feel so extremely honoured to have the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, just first of all, um, as Dave just said, everything that I'm going to say today is covered in a lot more detail in this upcoming paper. So you can make note of that if you drop me an email. My cards are at the front. If you're welcome to take one, drop me an email and I will be happy to send it out as soon as it comes out in the next couple of months. Also. Okay, so let's get going. So I start with one of my favourite quotes from Terence McKenna. I might even try and do it. Terence McKenna is not very good at those with it. <laughs> Friends, right <laughs> here and now, one quantum away, there is raging a universe of active intelligence that is transhuman. Hyperdimensional, <laughs> and extremely alien. Absolutely. Okay, so it's kind of it's things like that that really got me excited about DMT um, initially. First, from a sort of hypothetical standpoint, eventually from a practical standpoint, uh, and I can't imagine really a point in my life where I won't be studying this. Uh, Truly an astonishing uh, molecule. Um, so today what I want to do is talk to you about DFT, its interaction with the brain, its relationship with the brain, hopefully introduce a few new ideas about the way DFT works. So fortunately, uh, Alexander has talked a little bit, well quite a lot, about the phenomenology of DFT. I really want to focus on a specific aspect of the DMT experience. We all know that it's a very rapid, extremely intense trip that comes on very, very quickly, but doesn't fortunately last very long. But what's quite amazing is that within 30 seconds of inhalation, the consensus world is completely replaced, not partially replaced, completely replaced with an extremely bizarre, often described as hyper-technological alien reality, alien being uh, completely other. Um, entities, of course, highly intelligent entities are also very, very common. And Alexander uh, spoke about the familiarity, which is quite unusual. Something I won't talk about today, which I think could be very significant, is a uh, term I borrowed from John Mack, who studied the alien abduction syndrome, uh, ontological shock, essentially when you come back, that you have experienced something not only extremely strange, but something that is real. So, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the effects particularly, but this is from Strasman's book, and we see automatons, android-like creatures, but <coughs> living beings, not robots, often performing technological work. Sometimes the uh, tripper will burst into the space and they're expecting them. Sometimes uh, they're kind of uninvited and very much unwelcome, and often sometimes even just ignored. Uh, these are from the fantastic Erwin site, uh, and again and again and again, you get this idea of extremely advanced, extremely um, technologically, hyper-technologically uh, advanced um, realms that are occupied by, by these um, these beings. Elves, of course, feature um, heavily in these trick reports. Uh, these are generally described as extremely lively, cheeky, mischievous creatures. I was talking just last night to someone um, about some experience with the elves. And this comes up again and again. So it's truly remarkable to me that there should be these commonalities between the experience and yet, these worlds bear basically no relationships whatsoever to what we would call consensus reality. Terence McKenna went so far as to say that if you smoke enough DMT, properly prepared and uh, a high dose, you will get out. So these two appear uh, again and again. So what I want to do really is talk about the DMT reality, but from a slightly different perspective that maybe you've heard it spoken about before. Um, the problem with getting at the DMT reality is really the same problem we've got with getting at the consensus world. The world in itself, what Immanuel Kant called the noumenon, is not available to us, not accessible to us. What we have the access to is the phenomenon, the world as it appears. So that's really what I want to focus on. And I particularly want to focus on the brain. 
because I'm going to start with what I consider to, consider to be a very well supported assumption. And that is that if a world appears to consciousness, its informational structure must be represented in the brain. Now, I'm not, before you think, oh, this is some reductive materialist that's going to tell us that the brain creates consciousness. Um, hey, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really am not. I'm like, agnostic on that issue. This is nothing, nothing to do with that. However, we know, for example, if you remove a part of the brain that represents colour in the world, if someone has a stroke that affects that part of the brain, then the world becomes devoid of colour because the brain loses the ability to represent colour. So I'm not saying the brain uh, creates consciousness. I'm not saying that the brain creates these worlds of stuff, but, but that any world that appears to consciousness must have an informational representation uh, in the brain. So what I'm going to do is talk about how the brain works in a in terms of representing the informational structure of worlds. First, I'm going to apply it to the consensus world, uh, in the world we're all, all in, uh, and then I'm going to apply it to the DMT world uh, and draw some conclusions. So, the key to understanding the world building capabilities in your life of the brain is the thalamocortical system. So, the cortex is outer layer of the brain here, and the thalamus is sitting deep in the center of the brain. And these are heavily interconnected, so they actually form a unified. Uh, structure. I'm going to really going to focus on the cortex. There will be a little bit of um, technicality in this, but I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. So the best way to understand the way that the brain represents the informational structure of worlds is to break the brain up, or the cortex up at least. The cortex is really a folded sheet. It looks very bumpy with lots of uh, hills and valleys. It's actually a, a sheet. And you can think of the sheet as being broken up into Columns. Imagine columns sat side by side. These are functionally segregated. What that means is that each column has a different role in representing a feature of the world. Now, the best way to understand this, here we can see the columns from the side and the layers of the cortex. So, when you see these circles throughout this book, you're looking at cortical columns. They're actually thalamocortical columns because they're connected um, to the thalamus. Uh, but we will just call them cortical columns in simplicity. So the best way to understand what I mean by this functional segregation is to use probably the simplest example I can think of, a smooth blue square moving to the right. Now we're a long way from L singing possible objects into existence here, but this is kind of just to get the concept across. So this is the perceived visual object, this is the object that appears to consciousness. But of course there's no blue square in the brain as such. There is an informational representation of the, this blue square. So we can see here, I've labelled these cortical columns for your convenience, so it's clear to you. You see the motion, the colour, the texture, the form, etc. are represented by uh, specific cortical columns. And overall, this forms a unified structure. You'll notice that these cortical columns, you can see this here, they are not independent, they are connected to each other. This connectivity is really important. So this, you can think of this activation pattern as being the informational representation of this move to square moving in the direction. Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to use this 16 4 by 4 set of cortical columns to illustrate all my points. So make sure you understand that's what you're looking at. Now, of course, the brain is far more complicated than this with a very simple world, sorry, with a very simple cortex with 16 columns, you're not going to be able to represent very complex worlds. But the brain, of course, has billions and billions of these columns, which means that it can represent an effectively limitless number of uh, features of the world. This is why the world can appear so complex and beautiful. And also, you'll notice there are different patterns of connectivity. So, whilst the billions of cortical columns allow for practically an infinite number of activation patterns, each activation, each activation pattern being the informational representation of the world at a particular moment, not all of these activation patterns are accessible because not all of these activation patterns would represent meaningful perceptions. So the connectivity of these thalamocortical columns, these cortical columns here and the connections between them, 
means that they tend to generate certain patterns of activation naturally. And this is what I would call intrinsic activity. And in fact, your cortical columns will naturally represent the informational structure of the consensus world as a default. And we'll talk about dreaming shortly, and this is a validation of that concept. Another way to think of it is that the thalamocortical system, the system of cortical columns, cannot access all the possible activation patterns. Uh, this is often represented as an attractor landscape. So the, uh, the intrinsic activity tends to be attracted towards specific states. And this is really the world in which you live normally. Anything outside of here is basically inaccessible, <coughs> normally. Now this begs the question, if the brain or the thalamocortical system represents the informational structure of the consensus world as a default, how did it achieve this? The brain, as far as we know, is not dropped to earth, ready to construct your consensus world, or a representation of that world. It evolved to do so. And the best answer we've got so far is that throughout evolution, patterns of sensory data are sampled from the environment, and these tend to activate specific neural populations, specific cortical columns, and this leads to a strengthening of connection between certain cortical columns and a weakening of others. So you end up with a very specific pattern of connectivity which tends to generate the consensus world as a default state. Now, people tend to think of the visual system, which is really what we're focusing on today, uh, as like a camera. It's nothing like that at all. The vast majority of the information that is used to construct the world around you now is resulting from intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system. And in fact, only a small amount of what you might call extrinsic data, sensory data, um, is actually incorporated. And it doesn't really add to intrinsic activity, but it's matched to ongoing intrinsic activity. This is not a triangle, this is a pattern of sensory data. And this is matched to ongoing intrinsic activity which then amplifies. So your world, your waking world, is really like a dream that is being modulated constantly by small amounts of uh, sensory data. Another way to think of this in terms of evolution is that the brain learns and evolves to take complex patterns of sensory data, pass and render that data into a meaningful percept. But the take-home message is the world, uh, the consensus world, is a default state of the brain, modulated but not created by extrinsic sensory data. Now, when you go to sleep at night and you dream, the primary sensory areas, as they're called, the sensory areas that receive the data from the external world are shut down, as are the frontal areas, actually. Uh, but the brain continues to construct the consensus world because that's the default state anyway. Most models of dreaming support the continuity hypothesis. There are lots of studies of the phenomenology, the content of dreams. Um, and they tend to support the idea that dreams are continuous with weights, and they are functionally equivalent, neurologically and in terms of content. So, really important point from this is that the brain evolves the ability to represent the informational structure of any world. It has evolved the, the ability to uh, construct or represent the informational structure of the consensus world, and it even does so during sleep. So now we get to a question. We've established, and it's quite clear, that both the waking world and the dream world, these are both result from intrinsic activity of your thalamocortical system. Mainly, the difference between waking and dreaming is simply that waking is modulated to some degree by extrinsic data. This is not the case for the dream world as far as we know. So the question really about the DMT world is not is it real, but is it modulated by extrinsic data? It must result from intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system. The question is does it uh, is it modulated by some sort of external data source? And people who look at the commonalities between DMT experiences might suggest uh, that it does. How that works, how can the brain receive data from some other reality, is 
very difficult question. I do have an answer, but that's for uh, next time, in two years. Okay? Um, so what's truly astonishing about DMT is that the brain is even capable of building such exquisitely complex, bizarre realities that often seem more real than the waking world. Now, it's my position that the brain, this is not just an accident. It's not just an accident when you inhale 50 milligrams of N-N-dimethyltryptamine and you're instantly transported to an alien reality. I simply don't believe that. That doesn't sit with me at all. I really believe that this ability of the brain to shift between world-building modes, if you like, must have evolved. Now, when we look at other psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, or whatever, classical psychedelics, what you get, and I don't have time to go into the neuropharmacology of this in detail, but effectively, remember that the, normally the intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system represents the consensus world, and it's stable and it's predictable. And that's essential, of course. But when you take something like LSD or psilocybin, you get sort of a democratization of these cortical columns. And this allows for these novel thalamocortical states, these novel activation patterns of these cortical columns, which means the world goes from being stable and predictable to being unstable, fluid, unpredictable, and novel. This is one of the pieces of the psychedelic step. But with DMT, something quite different happens. This is not any old psychedelic state. Unlike the classical psychedelics or the other classical psychedelics, when you take DMT, it's as if the intrinsic activity of the thalamocortical system is suddenly shifting. It's as if the connectivity patterns have altered or that they were already there but they are now being expressed. So the brain shifts from generating intrinsic activity that build consensus world as a default, the shifting, constructing this completely different reality, and it is rapid, and I believe that it must have evolved to do that. And I'll talk about how that might work in a second. Another way of thinking about it is, we spoke about this attractor landscape. It's always as if there is another attractor landscape within the brain, within the complex connectivity of the brain, and DMT allows the brain to shift between them. So you're actually occupying Literally a completely different uh, reality. No worries. So, it occurred to me, the brain has evolved to construct the DMT reality in the same way to construct consensus reality, then we can imagine that, again, just like the brain's evolution of its consensus world building capabilities, if DMT was present in the brain, now it's really important that you remember that when the consensus world abilities, building abilities of the brain were developed, they developed the presence of serotonin, or 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Now, if, however, DMT was present in the brain, when data from a different reality were sampled, then you would develop a different pattern uh, of connectivity in the thalamocortical system, and this would generate, over time, over evolutionary time, would generate intrinsic activity that would build the DMT world as a default. Now, of course, you're saying, hopefully, the brain only has one evolution, that we evolved in this world, so how could it evolve uh, to construct a different reality? Well, I do have a solution to that, and it's what I call parallel neural evolution. Now, serotonin 5-HT is secreted during the day, uh, and during the day is when the evolution of your consensus world building abilities of your brain develop. This is clear, there's no um, controversy there. However, during the night, particularly during REM sleep, interestingly, but serotonin levels drop. Now, what doesn't happen now, as far as you know, is there's no DMT produced. But I suggest that DMT may well be an ancestral neuromodulator. Uh, and I believe that at some point in our evolutionary past, at night, DMT secretion would have been ramped up. Now, some of you might be thinking about the pineal gland here. The pineal gland, of course, secretes melatonin. Melatonin uh, secretion is triggered by darkness. So perhaps there's a link there. So during the night, the brain would 
evolve its ability to construct this alien reality, and during the day, it would learn to construct the consensus world. So in fact, <coughs> the brains have two patterns of connectivity, two abilities to construct two completely different realities. However, for some reason, it isn't clear why uh, there's been some sort of neural decline, uh, perhaps a contraction of pineal function uh, over the last 50 100,000 years. Uh, and so the NC levels in the brain now are very, very low, possibly not functionally significant. So what this means is that modern use of DMT, when they replace or reconstitute DMT in the brain, the brain shifts very, very rapidly from constructing the consensus world as a default to constructing this DMT reality as a default. Now, whether or not this is modulated by extrinsic data uh, from some sort of alien reality is unclear at present. Uh, well, that's something to think about. For the individual, this means that you, when you are not on DMT, the serotonin is basically present. Uh, and Dennis McKenna actually called reality a, uh, a serotonin hallucination. <laughs> and that's kind of how I think. I think of serotonin and DMT as being functionally equivalent. Serotonin locks the brain, locks the thalamocortical system in constructing this reality as a default state. However, when DMT floods the brain, uh, i.e. when you smoke it or you inject it, then your consensus world will simply disappear because the brain shifts into a completely different mode of intrinsic activity that constructs the alien reality as a default. It's why you lie back and you close your eyes. No point trying to sample data from the environment because the brain has actually lost the ability to pass and render sexy data from the consensus world. It's rendering data from a different reality. So, are there any predictions of this idea? If DMT truly is an ancestral neuromodulator, what would you predict? Well, you'd probably expect it to be structurally simple, readily synthesizable. Uh, you'd probably expect it to be metabolized in a similar rate as other neuromodulators in the brain. You wouldn't expect any tolerance effects, because, of course, tolerance to an endogenous neuromodulator is a pointless thing. Uh, you might expect it to be a substrate for various active transport systems in the brain, to pack it into neurons, etc. You'd expect the action to be clean, you'd expect to be able to administer it and see a, a dramatic shift in consciousness but not see peripheral uh, effects that cloud the experience or cause uh, um, unpleasant bodily effects. And you might expect to see vestigial subcycle secretion of DMT in the brain. Now, this is a bit of a, a, bit of a trick, really, because of course, for those of you who know about DMT, you know that those are in fact the characteristics um, of DMT. It's very, very simple. Uh, there's a rule of thumb in pharmacology that very simple molecules tend to bind very weakly to lots of different receptors, whereas very complex molecules tend to bind very few receptors, but very strongly. Now, DMT, you can't really get too much more simple. The indole ring here is the only, only thing really of much interest. There's no hydroxyl group that you have in serotonin. Even the amine here is masked by these methyl groups. And modeling studies have actually shown that the bulky methyl groups around that amine suggest that the amine is probably unable to interact with the receptor. So actually, this seems to be a completely blunt instrument. And as a chemical pharmacologist looking at this, with, and I didn't undergo its effect, I would say this is not going to be very interesting at all. I'd be wrong. Um, it's metabolized very, very rapidly, far more rapidly than the other classical psychedelics. Um, explained its very, very brief effects. Rick Strassman has shown that repeated administration of DMT does not produce tolerance. It is an active transport uh, substrate for various vesicular transporters that move uh, serotonin and other tryptamines um, in the brain. Its action is very, very clean. As soon as you smoke it, you get a good enough dose, of course. Then uh, the change from consensus reality to alien reality is complete. And indeed, people talk a lot about the DMT that's been found in the brain, CSF, in, in urine, etc. I'm not sure it's functionally significant at both these concentrations, but it does suggest that this is a vestigial, no longer uh, functionally significant secretion of DMT. Okay, so just to summarise. So the brain has evolved to represent the informational structure of any world, including the consensus world, including the DMT world, any world that appears in consciousness. The alien DMT reality, if you like, can be explained if we think of DMT not as just an exogenous drug, 
but our ancestral neuromodulators have a long-standing and intimate relationship with the brain and its evolution. And indeed, the unique pharmacological uh, peculiarities of DMT might support that conclusion. So DMT, I do not believe, is an accident. Uh, uh, and I guess to put it first, I'll finish with Terence McKenna, DMT is not a secret, it is the secret. I think he was right. Thank you.